I've been crucified with Christ I've been crucified with Christ I no longer live but Christ lives in me We welcome you today to our Bible study on the apostolic doctrine of eschatology the last few lessons we have been uh, teaching on the question, does hell exist today? And today's Bible lesson, we're going to continue talking about that subject. The question that often comes up is about eternal conscious torment. Going to hell and burning forever is not in the Bible. This is a doctrine that is man-made and... <clears throat> On the subject on eternal conscious torment simply does not exist in the Bible. But what do the scriptures say? The question is about the tradition of why the fate of the lost as torment forever is even uh, believed in. It's very unbiblical and is not hermeneutically correct. Why there is no the Bible says there is no immortal soul doctrine at all. It's not in the scriptures for the lost at all, anywhere. The scriptures teach that the soul is destructible and that immortality can only come through the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28, notice what the scripture said. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to, to destroy both soul and body in hell. God is the one that can destroy both your body and your soul. There is no immortal soul. In James chapter 4 and verse 12, There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy who art thou that judges another? God is the one. He's the one that can do it. He's the destroyer. He's the one that brings judgment. That judgment is eternal. We saw that in Revelation chapter uh, chapter 20, verses 14 and 15. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10, this is what the scripture said about immortality. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. It is only through the gospel message of Jesus Christ that you can receive immortality. Only through the gospel. That is the repentance, the water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ and the receiving of the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. That's the only way you can receive immortality is through the gospel message. In the, the scripture says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is only through Jesus that we can receive eternal life. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Not eternal existence in torment. The book of Ezekiel states clearly, The soul that sinneth it shall die in Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The death of souls did not occur until the year A.D. 70 at the white throne judgment. All of the dead were brought out of the holding place of the dead. Sheol, death, hell, and the grave. Gehenna, Tartaros, Hades. It was on that day that souls were put to death forever, for eternal death. Justice in its proper amount will be served, no more, no less, because God is a just God. 
It was the serpent who was first to suggest that sinners would not die in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Sadly, this is the same lie being told today, that everyone lives forever. But apart from the gospel, there is no immortality. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Destruction is the final fate of the unsaved. In Matthew chapter 10 verse 28, we said that God was able to destroy the body and the soul. A soul that isn't saved, a soul that isn't covenant connected through the gospel, has no ultimate end but its destruction. In James chapter 4 and verse 12, we said that only God has the power to destroy. In Philippians 3.19, Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. The end of the unsaved is their destruction. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, the Bible says this, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. The word destruction is meaningless if there isn't a point where the destruction is complete. In other words, you can't keep on destroying something for all of eternity. Conditional immortality correctly affirms the biblical position that the souls of lost people will all be destroyed at the white throne judgment. This is what the scripture calls the second death. The first death is temporary. In the first death, only the body is destroyed. Conditional immortality is that which is based upon the condition that you have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Faith is an action word. Always connected to faith, there is something that, that you do. In Hebrews chapter 11, it's often been called the faith chapter. After every name that's mentioned, there was always something that was done. Faith produces an action, a result. For by grace are you saved through faith. It is through the action of faith, an obedient action to something that God commands. That's what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. In the second death, the soul is destroyed, not preserved forever. Jesus said specifically in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, that the soul and the body would both be destroyed. Traditional theology wrongly states that the soul cannot be destroyed. This is a clear contradiction of God's word. Jesus mentioned Gehenna translated hell more than half a dozen times. In the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 22, 29, 30, Matthew 10, 28, Matthew 18, verse 9. But in Matthew 23, in verse 33, look what it said. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? And in Luke, chapter 12, in verse 5. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him, which after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. This is the hell, the Gehenna, the word Gehenna, hell fire. That was the fire of the, the lake of fire, the second death, that Jesus was making mention of there. In Jesus' day, Gehenna was the valley of Hinnom just south of Jerusalem. The inhabitants of the city would carry their, their garbage, including dead animals, bones, and other waste, outside the south gate of the city, still called to this day 
the dung gate, down the hill, and into the valley of Hinnom, into Gehinnom. The waste was dumped there and burned in the fires there until everything was completely burned up. They didn't know anything about a place where people burned alive forever in an immortal state. If Adam and Eve would have eaten of the tree of life in their sinful state, they would then have immortality. Therefore, God put a guard there to make sure that after they had sinned, they would not become immortal. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 22 and 24. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. It is only by believing and obeying Jesus that mankind has another chance at immortality. 2 Timothy 1 and 10, there again, it only comes through the gospel. It will be on the day of their resurrection that believers will then put on immortality when they are born again. Notice John chapter 3, verses 3 and verse 5. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And then again in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. The day that we received the baptism of the Holy Ghost was the day that we received eternal life. That's when we received our resurrection and immortality. You see, Christians don't die. Christians don't need a resurrection. Christians are not going to be resurrected out of the ground at some future time. We've already been resurrected. In John chapter 8, verse 51, Jesus told us that we would never see death. Death has been defeated. The last enemy to be defeated in the first book of Corinthians chapter 15 said death was the last enemy. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4, the Bible said there is no more death. There is no more death for born-again Christians, but there is death for the unsaved, the death of the body and the death of the soul. And that death is not going to endure forever, but the results, they are eternal. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 53 and 54, the Bible said, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. That happened on the last day of the last days in the first century, in the year A.D. 70. What people today call the rapture, is not a future event. That's something that happened to living, born-again Christians almost 2,000 years ago. Jesus said trees with bad fruit would be burned. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 19. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down 
and cast into the fire. And along with unfruitful vines in John chapter 15 and verse 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. It is the fire, the result of God's judgment, is a fiery end. He talked about useless weeds in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 40. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The word world there is the age, in the end of that age that happened in the first century, in the year A.D. 70. Everything that was not profitable for the kingdom, everyone who was not saved, not born again, not connected by the gospel, they had an ultimate end of judgment was to be the lake of fire, the second death, which is eternal. These things depict the fate of sinners at God's judgment. They will be cast into unquenchable, unextinguishable, meaning it's not going to be quenched until the job gets done. It's not going to be extinguished until everything is completely burned up and completely destroyed. The Greek word, katakeo, which means to consume, that is which is cast into the fire. It will be consumed. It will be burned up. The bush in Exodus chapter 3 and 2 that Moses appeared before, that bush was preserved by God. This is not going to happen with the wicked. The human soul is not immortal. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 16 said that only God has immortality. In John chapter 3 and verse 16, the Bible said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The word perish there in the Greek means a paluma, or to be destroyed. That's what's going to happen to people who do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Their ultimate end is that they are going to be destroyed. And that destruction is going to be for all time and eternity. Not in its duration, remember, but in its results. The proper biblical question is not where will you be in eternity, but will you have and eternity. Jesus stated plainly, He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. John chapter 12 verse 25. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. It is life itself that we can keep or lose. God's choice to us is always life. Life in bliss, never life in eternal torment. He always urges us to choose life. Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 and 14. Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. The broad way is the way that goes to destruction, eternal destruction, not in its duration, but in its results. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 8, for he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. It's life everlasting that we seek to find. Remember, our destiny is brought to us by choice, not by chance. You choose your destiny. Make sure that the decisions that you make are because you seek to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. In doing that, you will have 
immortality. That's the end of this lesson, part one. We're going to continue our next lesson on the question about eternal conscious torment. Any question, any input, you can email us at the New Covenant Apostolic Church at gmail.com. I've been crucified with Christ. I've been